And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery Art Business Academy online critique group session. Today is Wednesday, July 1st, 2020. Uh, it's good to be back here with you on a Wednesday morning. Uh, hard to believe it's July already. Uh, time has taken on a very surreal aspect, um, ebbing and flowing quickly and slowly. Uh, but here we are in July. Um, and uh, like I say, good to be here with you in another session. I, I have to tell you, I really look forward to these Wednesdays and, and getting the opportunity to look at uh, new art and uh, talk about art and um, uh, the, the business of art. And so with that, I'd like to jump right in. And um, this morning, uh, we're welcoming our uh, featured artist, Carol Bivens. And Carol, um, welcome. And tell us where you're joining us from, where your studio is located, and um, then give us a little bit of background. Okay, um, I'm in my home studio in the basement in Denver, Colorado. And um, I was an actor for many years in Los Angeles and New York, and then I moved to New Mexico and took up painting in 2008 and got serious about it a year later. And, and I think it took me until 2015 to make a really good painting or a painting that I, I thought actually I understood was a good painting that you were happy with. Yes, that and, made me proud. <laughs> excellent. And, um, and, and so um, prior to um, kind of diving in and getting started with painting, had you had an interest in visual arts? Um, you know, what kind of drew you in that direction? Well, the truth is in high school and junior high, I painted and took art class and graduating, I had to decide between art school and um, acting. And I thought, well, I may be a better actor than I am an artist. So let me go to New York and, and try my hand. And I met so many artists in the Soho region then, which was, of course, quite different because it's been so many years. And I just always loved art and went to museums all the time, but never started really painting again until 2008. And so let's um, jump in and start looking at your art. And as we do, um, I think that the other question, oh, let's see if I can get us here. Um, the other question I would have is what drew you in the direction of um, creating uh, abstract art, expressionist art? I think it's because I felt that I could accomplish something quicker. I'm not really a very patient person. And while most recently I have really expanded my representational practice at home, um, I've always been drawn to abstract art and, and you know, resented that people said, oh, my child could do that or a baby could do that or a monkey could do that. And, you know, there are differences. I think making a painting that is fully resolved and exciting to look at um, can be more challenging than a lot of people might think. Yes, uh, I've said it before here, I believe, but um, and, and I, I also have to restrain myself in the gallery um, when I have folks looking at abstract work and I hear that same, same say, oh, I could do this or, or um, you know, my kid could do this. Um, and, and of course, in our minds, we wanna say, just, just go for it. You just try and do <laughs> <Right>. it. <laughs> Sure. Could you create an abstract painting? Yes. Could you create one that is um, interesting and, um, you know, well composed and, uh, you know, something that we would want to look at? Now, that that's a much greater challenge. Um, and uh, I remember um, I had the opportunity um, uh, to uh, early in my career uh, have a, a long conversation with the uh, abstract expressionist artist Harry Jackson. Um, and um, he, he started talking a little bit about abstract art and, and um, kind of some of the, of the differences between working abstractly, because he had done both. He, he um, uh, kind of took uh, abstract expressionism and adapted it to the West and had done some representational work. And uh, his comment to me was, I mean, anyone can recreate a, a landscape or, or draw a figure um, you know, it's right there in front of you, but to create something completely from your imagination, now that takes courage and, and talent. And, um, and, and I've always appreciated that and, and I've grown um, over the years in my appreciation of, of abstract work. Now, of course, I would say not anyone can 
effectively paint a landscape or, or, or a figure either, but um, you know, it, it, it's just, it, it's a totally different approach to creating artwork and, and um, I very much appreciate it. Now, um, as, as we look at uh, these five images, um, it was, it's been kind of fun to read the responses that I've um, received from um, artists who've been reviewing the artwork and kind of different reactions to different pieces. Um, and and as, as we usually um, are want, I will begin by talking about the consistency of the work. And, and as per usual, um, I have to, to caveat this by saying it is a little hard to just take five pieces and determine from that the consistency of work. Um, it's such a small sampling. Um, but I, I did get some comments on consistency. Um, this from Sylvia in Texas. Uh, the first three pieces seem to be more patterning than image. It's difficult for me to see a focal point. The fourth piece is much more interesting. And although abstract has enough variation in color to attract my attention, uh, the last piece with the ghost face is not appealing. While the features are well done, there is too much contrast between the face and the remainder of the painting. Now I bring this one up first and, and a little, you know, a little critique there because then we're gonna get exactly the opposite reaction. Um, Gay says, uh, both strong, mysterious, Asher marks seem incised in the mysterious layer possible with, possible with cold wax. Um, I'm interested in how she preserved the surfaces once all is cured. I found it a fragile surface when I tried very professional and consistent work. So we've got two um, <laughs> contrasting views here. One saying, I don't know if it's consistent and the other saying, yeah, to me, it feels consistent, very interesting. Um, and obviously some, some technical questions there too, but we'll come back to those. Um, so I, I would love to open this up to discussion to our panel and um, have a conversation about that. Um, how consistent do you feel this work is? And again, um, as we talk about the consistency, I'd like to hear what you feel is consistent, what you have questions about in terms of the consistency. So let's go um, first, let me get us up here. So I can see everybody. Um, those of you in the video panel, if you want to hop in and throw a hand up and let me know what you think of the consistency. And those of you who aren't in the video panel, um, if you want to click on the raise, uh, raise your hand icon, um, I can bring you in as well. Um, so let me go to Elizabeth first and uh, get your reaction to the consistency of the work. Um, I think I sent in a comment about it that the, the first three seem to be part of a series to me, which obviously makes it those first three very consistent. But I wouldn't have any problem seeing all five of these in a show and knowing it was the same artist. And um, I think it's just because, I mean, this is really obtuse, but a, there's a feel to it. You know, it's, it's, um, there is some sense of, of style with the mark making in the first three, and then she gets away from that in the, in the other two. But um, there's just a certain feeling about all five of them that connect it for me. Um, I don't need a hardcore visual um, lineage, you know, sometimes to connect a, a person's work. Okay, good. So I've got one in the yes, I see the I can see it all as the same artist. Do I have um, anyone else who'd like to hop in with a uh, comment on the consistency? And if not, if I don't get volunteers, then I may volunteer you and draw you in. <laughs> I'd like to hear a few more perspectives. Uh, let's see, Terry, do I have you? Let me, uh, it'll ask you to unmute. Uh, good morning, Terry. Now. Yep. I, I could tell they were all the same person. I would hang them together. Um, the thing that I actually missed though, as I scrolled down, I think it was unfair to start us with the first three because they were so similar. <laughs> yeah. And then jump down to the next. And what I missed in the next one was just what I got set up for in the first three, which was the, the more shape oriented, um, almost I could read something into it, but not quite, you know, it kind of drew me into trying to make up what was there or tell a story. Um, and then when we went back down to the, the face, I actually liked that. I thought that was a great, um, just added some volume and depth to what she was doing. But I do find that they're consistent and I haven't been to her website. So there may be more like the La Vida Rosa um, in there, 
but even even without i'm fascinated by the technique with the, with the wax so the technique would keep me looking <laughs> yes and it, so we're going to come back and talk about that in just a minute because there were a number of, of questions and comments about um, uh, the, some of the technical aspects of creating the work uh, let me go to rachel and rachel let's see if i can get you in and unmuted good morning rachel hi um yeah, I love her work and I went on her website and Carol, it's fantastic. Um, I, the only thing I would say is like, uh, like when you look on her website and I, I know you guys probably aren't right this minute, but uh, if you do, you see on the first page, the ones that kind of have a diptych aspect to them, like the ones we're looking at here. And then on the next page, it goes into to the one with the face and um, the Vion Rose one is next to that. So um, my only suggestion would be maybe to um, divide these into series or some sort of collection um, so that as the viewer sees that I can see as I look through her website that there are some that look really cohesive as a collection, still looking all by the same artist, but sometimes, you know, it's more of a, a, a thought process in a certain collection that I see. Um, and I don't know if, Carol feels that way. But, and the only other question I had, which you'll probably get to later is I wondered about the pricing. I thought it seemed a little low for that size and beautiful work, so. Okay, good, yes. We will definitely talk about um, pricing, but I, I think what we're hearing um, in the comments um, that we've had so far is an echo um, of, of a lot of what I saw you writing in. Um, that one, there's just a, a, a strong interest in your style and, and approach, um, a, a lot of comments about how um, interesting and engaging it is. Um, and and um, overall, a sense that um, there is a, a consistent thread across the work that, that helps tie it together. Um, Carol, uh, we, we got to hear other people talking. Now let's, let's talk to you. Um, talk a little bit about how you think of these works um, in terms of kind of the um, progression from one to the next, are you working in series? What, what's kind of your process in terms of thinking about um, the overall body of work? Well, thanks to everybody for those excellent comments. Um, actually, the first three that you saw were part of a series that um, I was asked to create by a gallery here in Denver, just go make a series and send me the images. And the thing I really struggled with is how does one make a series in abstract art? Is it color, pattern, um, mark? You know, what, the, what elements are going to make a series? So I deliberated for actually a couple of months and I decided that I would, I always paint the surface of my panels, sometimes with representational work. And then I cover it over so that when I do the reduction, you know, there's color, there may be an image or an eyeball or something interesting that, that comes through when I, when I scrape back. Um, and so I decided to have a divided palette and tape off the edges and tape a stripe down the middle and then make all the colors different, you know, just technical, how do I make a series using different colors and which mark should I focus on to try and get them to be cohesive? So. It was my first series. I've not done many. I don't know if it's lack of discipline or, or um, lack of understanding, but I find I'm just an intuitive painter. And the last two were paintings done before this series. And that's just me, you know, attacking the panel. And this is the painting that comes out. The face was a last ditch effort to make that painting work. I couldn't figure out what to do with it and I could not resolve it. And I just thought, you know, I'm interested in trying representational. I'm going to put the face in there. <laughs> yeah, and and so um, you know, it, it is certainly interesting, and and um, I um, think that there is some definitely as your um, uh, body of work continues to grow and develop, um, it would become important to start thinking about the um, narrative. Um, be, between the different works and how to organize them in a way that there is um, the, the most natural progression from one to the next that you can get. And I'm thinking in terms, I, I think Rachel mentioned it, um, in terms of the website, you'd wanna think about how, how do I want people to encounter these works? In what order do I want them to be seeing them? Um, 
I because think that, that, that can have a huge idea. impact. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I think that's an excellent idea. And I, I think, you know, my, my built that website and I think my lack of technical skills have kind of prevented me for, from trying to actually upgrade it and make it more precise. But I think what you're saying and what Rachel said is actually, you know, really true and, and would help the website. Yeah. And it's um, something that, um, you know, kind of that thought process would not only apply to the website, um, as you were putting together a portfolio of the work, you'd want to think about it there. As a gallery owner, as, as I'm hanging the work, I'm going to want to think about it that way. Um, you know, uh, which pieces could stand independently um, in an entry of the gallery if, as I'm hanging a grouping together? What's going to go on the left? How am I going to progress then to the, to the pieces on the right? It's, it's just kind of a, um, you, you know, so it, it can be a challenge because a lot of times we tend to really get focused in on each individual piece and think of them individually. Um, but, and, and they can obviously be very powerful that way. And ultimately they're going to end up in a, in a collection in, in a uh, collector's home and are going to be experienced um, potentially individually, hopefully um, a collector ends up with, with multiple pieces. And then they're going to need to start thinking about um, uh, that grouping. And, and it does become a thought process for them. If I have one, what's the next one and how does it relate to the first one that I have uh, and so on. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it, I imagine that for an artist, it's a bit of a challenge to be thinking that way because, you know, in the moment, a lot of times you're working on one piece or, or maybe a couple of pieces and, and to kind of um, uh, think of them in terms of how they relate to one another um, I would imagine could be a little bit of a challenge, but I, I love this, um, that this gallery challenged you to create a series and that led to those, those first three pieces, which I think universally we can all agree, definitely feel like they're um, a tight cohesive body and could show together. With the other two pieces, uh, Levy and Rose and, and um, the, the piece with the face, my suggestion would be to start thinking, well, how could I add some additional pieces to create more of a series in each of these veins. Yeah, that's um, a great and idea. That by so doing, you then start creating very powerful um, narratives. And even though they have, even though there's some variation between those narratives, um, by having, um, well, I guess what you're doing is preventing having any orphans um, among the, the <laughs> body of work that feel like they're, you know, that they need um, companion pieces. Uh, right. Juanita, I think I saw that you have a comment. Um, let me see if I can get you in. It should ask you to unmute on your screen. Did I'm muted? Gotcha. Great. Uh, Carol, I like your work. The last two, I still see the theme of your circles and the center division coming through very strongly. I think on the one, uh, in the days of everything, uh, the yellow circles that surround and form a larger circle, I'd like to see more variation in the sizes of those, or maybe the color. Um, they're very similar. Uh, and also, th while the face is lovely, I, th I think it, if part of it were obscured, maybe one of the eyes a little more obscured would, to me, bring a little more interest and a little less direct in your face, um, face. presentation <laughs> of, the, of yeah. the theme. Yeah, pardon the pun, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and and um, what I, I suspect would happen, um, again, it's an argument for kind of thinking in terms of series, is that if there were multiple um, pieces with faces, that starts to offer, offer opportunities for variation and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this piece in the context of some other pieces would probably become a more interesting piece because then we have something to um, that you know, to draw with. from and compare it to. Yeah. yeah. Right. I think that's an excellent idea. And, and um, in terms of looking for another series, that's going up to number one. <laughs> yeah. And, and certainly um, uh, as we look at the other pieces and then we encounter this one, um, there is something so strong about this piece, um, you know, and, and again, it's in context with the other pieces. It's a contrast to those, to those other works. Um, and, and certainly um, I, I would suspect that in a gallery where you had several different groupings going, um, the, the faces would certainly stand out. Now, as we saw in the comments, um, some folks are going to be drawn to the faces 
And for other people, it could be a very jarring um, transition and, and they may not be as interested, but that's what makes art um, so fascinating and engaging is that um, we get to have those little surprises. And um, I find uh, even, if, even if our clients aren't all responding in a positive way to something that is um, uh, standing out, um, just the fact that it's standing out means it's getting more attention and um, we tend to sell work that gets a lot of attention. And, and so it's certainly something to think about and, and to contrast. Now, um, you know, we've kind of talked in the past many times um, repetitively about kind of thinking about um, formally about um, the consistency of the work. And as I look at your work and think about my criteria for consistency, is the subject matter consistent? Is the style consistent? Are the thematic elements, the palette, the presentation, are those all consistent? Um, I would agree with what we've said here, and that is that I can definitely see that that common thread, um, and and that as you continue to build and experiment and and grow the body of work, I, I think you're you're on on a great track for consistency. And um, you know, it's also inevitable. You haven't been at this terribly long, um, you know, compared to to some who've been doing it for forty or fifty years. Um, and, and so it is natural, and I would anticipate um, with an artist who is at your stage of your career, that yes, you'd want to be drawing towards more consistency, but I would also expect um, that there is still going to be a, a pretty strong desire for self-exploration and, and experimentation and, and to see um, what directions really feel most effective and, and successful to you. So it's kind of that balancing act then of figuring out, um, you know, as I move forward, how do I strive for that consistency, but still allow myself some latitude to, to, to do experimentation? Um, and tell us what you're thinking about, um, you know, in terms of the next pieces coming out of the studio and, and the direction that you're headed in. Um, well, I, I think my personal opinion of my own work is that um, I understand color intuitively in many ways. I, I, um, I, I decided because I've done so much color uh, that I wanted to apply myself to black and whites. So I've begun a smaller series on canvas, which I really have, don't have a lot of experience working on in um, oil and cold wax on canvas using very muted neutrals, black, whites, grays, creams, browns. And I've got eight paintings and most of them are drying on the wall and, yeah. and um, they're, they're not as good as I want them to be, but I think that I will continue to stick with that while pursuing, um, you know, again, some more representational in the mix because I do like that. Trying to make a great black and a great black and white painting, you know, just without the benefit of the excitement that color can bring. Excellent. Um, and, and so that uh, takes us to talk a little bit about um, some of the more technical aspects and um, presentation. Um, so you mentioned you've, you've worked on panel, you're now experimenting um, with Canvas as well. Um, and we had a lot of questions about um, uh, your medium and how you're achieving the, the marks that you are. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, process and um, wh what you find working and what have been challenges in, in the technical process of creating the work. Well, um, I, I mentioned earlier, I always paint the surface of the canvas with whatever I'm interested in. Um, faces, circles, just marks, triangles, a lot of geometry. Um, I just like laying a groundwork and it's practice for me then to do representational things and trees and skulls, things I'm not good at that are going to be covered over and aren't going to impact the final version except in these incidental and hopefully surprising ways. And then I choose a color and I just start layering it. And um, I used a squeegee for most of everything that um, is up there. So it's a weird thing. I don't use brushes. The wax, uh, I mix it as a medium, um, sometimes equal parts, sometimes a little more oil using Gulkid gel and apply it with a palette knife and a squeegee and drag it around. And um, a brush will leave kind of strange marks in it. So it's rare that I use a brush. Though on the face painting we discussed earlier, I did go in, that was the last part. I just got a little brush and put some gray 
oil paint on it to make that face. And then I scraped it back a little to get the variations of color in the lips and the eyes. So it, for me, it's always an additive and then subtractive process. And um, how did you um, how did you come to use the media that you're using the the oil and cold wax? I was in a class in Santa Fe, a workshop, and um, the woman mentioned cold wax, and I'd never heard of it. The instructor, and um, I tried to research it for a long time. I could not find any information, and then after about eight months, I found a book. I think it. Uh, can I say who who wrote the sure, book? Sure, absolutely. Um, I. I, it was Serena Barton, and I believe it was her Wabi Sabi art, and she explained working with cold wax. So I got a can from the art shop and started working. And all of a sudden, a really good painting happened. It just clicked. I made, I sold the first one. Um, actually, the two in this, the bottom two are the very first two that I tried that are in this, and they're, uh, their catalog to go in a show in September here in Denver. Um, I did another, I did the third or fourth painting and it just was working. I just was understanding how I could slide the paint around, scrape it around. And the, and my painting started coming together in a way that one of the first paintings um, actually won an award. I was shocked, but it made me decide that I could take my work to a photographer and build a website. It, it was an exciting discovery, actually. Yeah, those um, uh, affirmations that come along the way, the um, uh, and positive comments, um, awards, and, and of course, um, the sales um, certainly proved to be a, a boost in a, in a confidence builder and um, uh, encouragement to continue pursuing and, and creating the work. Um, I, I would... Um, as we just quickly look, I, I ask for images of the, the fronts, the backs, the sides of the pieces. Um, and, and of course, we're only seeing a few examples here, but um, uh, from what I'm seeing here, I, I, and, and this is, is really important um, for all of us, but um, it, you know, I, I think especially I experience it with a lot of abstract artists that um, uh, the, the um, surfaces that you're working on, the panels, the, the canvases, uh, and the backs of the pieces. Um, sometimes, in, in my experience, abstract artists, the um, chaos that's occurring in front of the, the creation of the piece can extend to other aspects of, of the work, um, and, and the back of the piece becomes um, a, a little bit questionable in terms of presentation, or there isn't a lot of thought put into um, uh, the, the substrates and, and um, you know, sometimes it's whatever I can find and lay my hands on. But to me, it looks like you are putting thought into the, um, the surfaces that you're working on and the presentation of the piece. So talk a little bit about that. Have, um, you, you know, are you showing most of your work unframed and, and kind of what's your, your um, thought process in terms of the physical presentation of the work? Well, um, I, I do show these unframed mostly because of the size and, you know, it was just to add so much weight and uh, the cost would be fairly astronomical and add so much to the painting, I doubt I could sell one. So when I have, and I do have a lot of my panels custom made, I found people both in Santa Fe and here in Denver that can give me the exact uh, dimensions that I'm looking for. Um, I treat all of my panels first with uh, several layers of GAC 103, and that leaves, it's almost like a varnish, but then if you get anything from your hands, you transfer anything to the sides, um, once they're dry, of course, I do tape them off, but if you're moving them around and they're still wet, the oil paint, you can just wipe it right off. It's, it's really a repellent so that I can keep the sides really pristine. I sand them, I make sure that, um, you know, that they are smooth if there are pits. Some of the, the panels that I've purchased um, from retailers have pits and they have to be filled in with wood and then sanded. And, you know, because I don't frame, those sides have to look as pristine as possible. Yes, thank you. Um, this is, um, I, I, I just, you, you know, I, I wanna be careful in how I couch this and, and um, I don't wanna offer any offense, but, 
Um, if your presentation is, uh, if you think of it as a, an inconvenience or if it's an afterthought um, or, or if you don't think about it at all, um, ultimately, unfortunately, it can really um, prove to be a, a detriment to the, um, to the display of the work, to the longevity of the work, um, and, and certainly um, to uh, my ability as a gallery owner um, to, to market and promote and sell the work. It really does matter. It makes a big difference um, in, in showing the work in how our collectors are going to respond to the work. And, and um, we, we, you know, um, we want to put forethought into that and be proactive in making sure the quality of the presentation um, matches the quality of the work that's being produced um, on that presentation. Now, that gets us to the question of pricing. Um, talk, Carol, a little bit about your approach to um, determining how to value your work. Well, I start out with kind of a mathematical formula, you know, the, the $1.75 per inch. Um, and then if I, I also understand where I am in this industry and I'm, you know, not going to be selling uh, paintings at $10,000 at this stage. Are you not though? Are you not? Are you sure about that, Carol? Well, I did sell one the size of Living in America in May, the, the one of the final pieces that I was quite excited that that sold. And this one has just been accepted, uh, juried into a show here in Denver. So I'm hopeful. And then my feeling is if I, if I can sell at this price point, then at some point, if they're all gone, maybe the price point raises, but- Starts to climb. Yeah. Yeah, um, certainly um, I, I would say, and, and we already had a little hint at it that, well, there's, there's a sense that maybe the, the prices could, could be increased a, a little bit. Um, it, it's valid to, and, and I've, I've suggested it here before, to take a look around in the marketplace and see um, how other artists um, in your genre and, and um, who are kind of competing for wall space, how they are pricing their work. And I do suspect that if you were to do some of that analysis, you'd find yourself a little bit on the low end of that. Um, which yes, can can um, uh, you could think of it as, well, maybe that's a little bit of a competitive advantage. I find that a lot of times in the art world, it ends up being a competitive disadvantage um, where um, if we're saying this feels a little low to me, sometimes collectors are going to say that as well. Um, and instead of thinking that they're, oh, well, I'm, I'm getting in early and getting a bargain, they might think, well, maybe I'll just wait a little while and see how this artist develops and how their career goes. Um, and, and, and sometimes just having a little higher price point can, can really help um, with establishing credibility with collectors. And, and it is certainly a balancing act. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, ultimately it's going to become a question, as you mentioned, of kind of supply and demand as the work sells and, and the demand increases, um, naturally the prices are gonna wanna increase. But I do, I, I, I'm gonna echo that I feel like $1.75 an inch um, feels a little bit low to me um, uh, for a starting point. Um, we were in, in the, we, I, I, we, my wife and I opened our gallery in 2001 and from 2001 until about 2005, 2006 in that, that um, time frame, we had several different artists who were in that $1.75 per square inch range um, who we were selling fairly well. And, and that was kind of a price point um, that we looked at as, as a prime um, per square inch price point for larger, um, more abstract work. Um, that was though going on, you know, 15 to 20 years ago. And um, we, you know, we have certainly seen those, those values increase. And I would just encourage you to start poking around and looking at other artists um, in venues where you're potentially showing your work or interested in showing your work and see how they're pricing. And I suspect that you'll find more of the price points now in the 250, 225, let's say 225 to $3 per square inch as, as kind of more of a baseline. And it would be worthwhile thinking about moving in that um, direction with your, your pricing as well. Um, we won't push you to do it, but um, certainly I would encourage you to, to investigate and just kind of see um, how, other, how other artists are pricing. Now, um, I have a number of comments and, and questions that have come in. Um, one that I see in the chat, a, a question, um, let's see where it went here. Um, 
uh, this question from Chris. Actually, Chris, I think I've got you here in the panel. Do you want to ask, um, can I unmute you? You got a question about um, uh, Carol's two disparate careers and how they might interact with one another. Yeah, I um, I had a little bit of trouble with my, uh, excuse the phone there. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with my um, mic. Um, did your um, acting career, um, did any of your emotional highs and lows from, you know, getting a part or, uh, or um, anxieties of going on in uh audition have any interface with your uh, with your work well i think that's such an interesting question and my answer would be that it, i would be certain that it would have uh, i felt like i was doing an audition before we <laughs> logged on i was anxious um, <laughs> but if so it's not something that i am consciously you know in contact with or aware of um, i know that my compulsion to be uh, a good actor pushes me to try and be a really good painter. I don't, I don't want to just paint. I want to be really good at it. I want to get good. And my only fear is that starting so late in my lifetime, I may not have enough years to, to get to the place where I feel, you know, really proud of everything I've accomplished. You're so, just going to have to work much harder. That's all there is to it. That's it. Faster and harder. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it is. A, I, I appreciate that que question, Chris. Um, I can't help but um, from time to time, kind of think about some of the perils or parallels in creative fields, um, you know, between artists, actors, musicians, um, and, and, you know, kind of think about some of the similar experiences they, they're having, some of the similar odds that they face in terms of breaking through and um, becoming successful. Um, and uh, it, it is really interesting to think about showing your work um, you know, very much is putting yourself out there um, in the same way an actor would in 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 a performance, um, and and kind of seeing how people respond to it, and and um, so it's it's interesting that you have had both of those experiences. I, I sometimes think painting is even harder because when you're auditioning, you have lines to, in effect, hide behind. It's character, so you can do that character or or not, but this isn't a character. This is actually what's inside me and it comes out and that's kind of the way it works. So it's- So I think um, your screenwriter and performer all in, in one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Claudia um, from Prince Rupert, um, which I believe is in British Columbia says, I enjoyed the lightness of the work and the lines include, I particularly liked La Vie and Rose, but undoubtedly because of the song, um, I do like the direction your work is taking. And then I just had to pull a similar con, uh, comment from Cassandra in San Diego. My personal favorite is Levy and Rose, since I love complementary colors. And of course, Edith Piaf. Um, I, I just wanted to comment quickly on that, that and, and, and we haven't talked a lot about this in past sessions, how much of an impact um, titles can mm -hmm. have on people's experience with work. And here we saw two independent con comments of one another, and I had several others who commented on the title of this piece. Um, boy, can make very strong associations and have a, a significant impact on people's experience. And I have several artists that I work with that I represent and show their work um, who incorporate um, music into their work um, or, or the, the, the titles into pieces. Um, and it's amazing what an, an, an interesting um, impact that can have. And, and so, Carol, we don't have a ton of time left, but um, uh, talk a little bit about your process for titling the work, um, because with abstract work especially, um, it is a delicate process of, um, you know, giving a title and, and kind of um, uh, giving viewers some direction um, without um, uh, kind of crushing their own experience of, of the piece and, and bringing their own interpretation to it. Well, I absolutely agree. I think titles, good titles are essential. I, I firmly believe I've sold two paintings based on titles almost alone and the experience of the person that they were having at the time, the way they responded to the title compelled them to purchase the painting. So um, I am fortunate in that often a title will come to me when I'm working on the piece. I know exactly what I'm going to call it. 
Um, La Vie en Rose, a, a collector of a piece of my work that was quite pink, pink was their favorite color, mentioned the song to me and I realized that it was an excellent title for that painting. Yeah, and um, boy, I will echo again what you just said that um, uh, I, I am not a big fan of untitled number 47. Right. Um, you, you know, yes, I do understand that you want to leave some latitude for um, the, the viewer to, to bring their own experience. Um, and, and sometimes a title can start to feel heavy handed. But um, I, I have just found over and over again that um, as someone is experiencing the artwork and then, as you say, as they see that title and it resonates with them and, and echoes what they're feeling um, as they see the work that has a very, very powerful effect. And, and um, so, and, and I think that we all know, um, I, I mean, not every title is going to be a home run in that right. way, but then there are those moments when you, you just, you hit it and, and it feels like, it, as you say, that the piece gave itself a title um, that, that that can be very effective. And so we wanna be priming ourselves um, to be in a position where we can, can um, have that occur uh, and and um, I, I think that uh, seeding the ground with a lot of um, uh, creative input, reading and um, poetry and literature and music, um, that that can really help um, uh, put you in a position where you're ready to have those kinds of experiences. I often do when I'm reading or reading a, a, an article, if there is a phrase that strikes me because I do love to read, I'll write it down because a permutation of that phrase may be my next great title. So when things strike me, the way that the, the writer has put words together, I definitely wanna take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, a, a high point to end our conversation today. And we are out of time. Um, Carol, thank you so much for um, joining us, um, for sitting in the hot seat and letting us look <laughs> at your work and um, feedback. Um, uh, we, we will look forward to, to um, keeping up with you and seeing how your work is developing. Um, I, I didn't get to get to the many comments, um, which, which in fact, if I just started scrolling here, the, the words that I, I saw over and over again were fascinating, interesting. I loved the work. Keep oh. doing what you're doing. Um, in fact, Ted, um, also from British Columbia, says, carry on. I love them. Um, and I, I think that's um, uh, something that, that we've heard over and over again from, from the comments. So um, uh, keep at it and we'll look forward to seeing the work develop. Um, we'll look forward to seeing your website evolve and develop and, and show the work and uh, from hearing uh, about your future experiences and uh, showing to the work. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, and to everybody who, who participated. It's been great. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll look forward to, we'll be back here uh, next Wednesday. For those of you in the States, hope you have a great uh, Independence Day weekend, although this weekend is probably going to be less independent than we're accustomed to for these kinds of weekends. Um, but we'll look forward to seeing you back here next Wednesday for the next online critique group. Thanks, everyone. Take care.